Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Glenn, and I am an alcoholic. I'm really, really grateful that uh, I was asked. Thanks, Janessa, for that. And uh, I think that I may have shared here before, so uh, to get asked again is a real privilege. Um, it's an honor to speak for Alcoholics Anonymous anytime, anywhere. And uh, it's, it's also a responsibility that I don't take lightly. Uh, it, the answer is always yes. It's just a matter of dates that I have to get figured out. Um, I have a couple of notes that I always like to start with so I don't forget. Um, before I do it, I, you know, I don't want to forget. Uh, Quentin, uh, I pray that the Lord be with uh, you, your uh, whole health care team, uh, that it would touch their hearts, minds, and hands as they go through this process with you, that your family will be comforted and that you will all, uh, that God will grant you the power to accept his will and this outcome. All right. So, and, and beyond that, I, I like to say thanks, uh, you know, for all the people who showed up here. Uh, I really, really appreciate all the participants, the readers, uh, the people here doing service. Jaden, thank you. I thank Bob. But there are probably other people behind the scenes that I don't know about. And uh, I really, really appreciate you. Um, uh, my vitals is that uh, I have a sobriety date. And if you don't have one, we all need one. So if you know close to it, just pick one. That's what I did. Uh, and my sobriety date is five four of 2017 which is may the 4th and and so if anyone here watched star wars may the 4th be with you all right uh, had something to do with it a little geeky about that i guess um i would really like to thank god for an opportunity you know, that he's afforded me a voice and, and an ability, uh, a few things that have happened in my life that have uh, given me the power to touch other people in, in a way. And I don't know, other folks say that I'm worth listening to. I'm just going to believe them. I'm just going to believe them. So, um, I have a sponsor. His name is Bill T. And uh, he, he's a past delegate, uh, panel 51 here, and served at the General Service Conference. He also did some other stuff around that. He's our local area archivist. And he's taught me a lot of stuff about the past. And he continues, like, we meet every week on Friday. We get to get together. And, uh, you know, he teaches me more things. You know, I've learned about uh, the most of the 36 spiritual principles involved in our program. I've learned about the six warranties in Concept 12 that allow us to uh, that keep things in check. Uh, and I'm really grateful there's so much going on in this program, uh, not in this program, pardon me, in this fellowship that uh, keep it safe from people like me. 
really keep it safe for me uh, that, that I've been able to learn a few things about the traditions. And the most important one uh, is about unity, that I'm not doing anything divisive here. I'm not trying to do anything that's going to separate uh, anyone from Alcoholics Anonymous or from us coming together. You know, uh, I don't want to say anything that uh, makes anyone here feel a certain way like they might not want to come back. And that's really important. The tradition, too, for me is the most important um, that, the, you know, there's one ultimate authority in it. Now it's talking about the group conscience, but uh, huh. seems like Luke's having a problem. There we go. And uh, at any rate, that uh, it basic, basically that God is the ultimate authority. And thank gosh, what a weight off my shoulders because I thought I had to be the ultimate authority when I got here. I had to know, I, I believed I knew everything or, or I had to have an answer. And, and I've learned now that uh, the best answer in the world that I can have is I don't know, let me get back to you. Uh, and then I talk to people, uh, other people in this program who know more than I do and can help me find an answer. And I check with more than one. I really, I check with more than one. Um, so that way there's a group and it's the conscious of that group. And uh, uh also, I have a home group. It's called Love and Tolerance, uh, where I, I get to serve uh, as a GSR in that group. And uh, I get to do some things around that that maybe I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, I have a big book. I have a big book. Really, really important. Uh, and, and, you know, if anyone doesn't have these things, the sobriety date, the sponsor, the big book, the home group, you can get them all right here. You can get them all right here. And if anyone has any questions, my number's right there. And feel free to contact me. I'm on WhatsApp, Telegram plenty of uh, things other than that, you know, if you're in the States, go ahead and get a hold of me directly. Um, this stuff and this, this whole deal, the program outside of the fellowship that in that book, there's a program. It consists of 12 steps and uh, they sometimes seem daunting. They're not pretty simple. It's read, write, and talk. Real simple, real easy. Uh, but the problem is, when I first got here, not only did I want to know everything, because I really wanted to impress you because I'm a please like me a holic. And uh, I can't stand to think you don't like me. I'm terribly sensitive. I get my little feelings hurt all over everything. And it's really because I'm afraid you won't like me uh, is what it comes down to. And, uh, you know, I was afraid to talk to people. Making amends uh, allowed me the freedom to know that uh, I was able to talk to other people and I got to lose my fear of them. I got to lose my fear of them through doing a few things. Um, and also, like, above everything, that there is a God that, that through that God's mercy and grace, 
uh, I've been able to uh, not only be living, but to get sober. And I'm only sober by the grace of God and the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and not necessarily in that order, because it was the 12 steps that brought me to God. And, and I really just had to make a decision in step three that brought me uh, to a God in somewhere in step nine. And uh, well, let's get to this. Um, I can be done with these notes. I really don't like looking at notes. Um, all right. I, I was... Uh, I lived, had lived in an alcoholic home. So meaning my father was a self-pronounced alcoholic and in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says we don't like to pronounce anyone an alcoholic. So he pronounced himself an alcoholic. My mom, we don't like to pronounce anyone an alcoholic. Okay. She hasn't done that. She hasn't done that yet. So I'm not going to put that on her, but, uh, Things were crazy in my household. There was a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. And um, there was verbal, physical, and sexual abuse directed at myself and many of the people in our circle of friends. And when the doctor's opinion says that the alcoholic life seemed the only normal one, I've been living that life for a long, long time. And uh, for me, I was really, really, I was a pretty grateful and happy kid most of the time. Um, but I got to tell you, at night when the bar closed, and the headlights came across the window, you know, and they came out of the car. You hear the door slam and they're screaming at one another and you know what's going to end up happening. Uh, that's when I started feeling like I was going to pee on myself, right, as a little kid. And so that's just the way things were around my house. There was a lot of times I tried to get myself in the middle of it. Um, thinking that it was my fault and that, you know, if I apologized and explained that, I, you know, I'm very sorry for whatever I did that, that started all this mess. And, you know, I really thought I was very powerful. <laughs> I really thought I had a lot of power, that uh, I, I was powerful enough to cause them to do these things. And uh, it had nothing to do with me. But that's the way I am. I'm selfish and self-centered. And anytime there's something going on with someone else, I automatically think that it has something to do with me. And that's really just my crazy thinking. And, and alcoholism has got a lot more to do with thinking than it has to do with alcohol. You know, alcohol is just the vehicle that allowed me to escape my thinking. And when I was a kid, so my pops, you know, and I, like, we did the, I opened beers for him and stuff, but uh, really what it was is me uh, looking for approval. And I, I would, you know, go and get a beer out of the fridge and, scooted a chair up against the counter and climb up there and get a spoon so I could pop open the lid. Uh, so I don't know how young I was, pretty young. And uh, it just, it turned out like, it seemed like my dad gave me a lot of approval. You know, when I took that drink and the bigger drink I took, he was really, uh, he would seem like he was very proud of me. And so I was a mind reader. <laughs> I was a mind reader from a very young age. I was telling myself what other people thought. And believe me, that's, that's, a, not, a, that's not a true statement. Um, so behind all that craziness that was going on in the household, um, 
they ended up getting a divorce. My pops went somewhere else, you know, and I got to tell you, like around that house when he was there and after he left, they smoked a lot of left-handed cigarettes. And if you're not familiar, it's kind of you roll up and share with other folks and and uh, <laughs> people get a little happy from them. And um, so when uh, my pops, when those things would get real small, he'd put them on an alligator clip and he would sniff them up his nose. And I would see those tendrils of smoke going up his nose when I was a little kid. I would think, man, that is cool probably a sign things weren't going to go real well in this in this dude's life but uh you know whatever and then because i i was such an attention seeker then when a whole bunch of people would be sitting around the house doing that i would go out into the middle of the room and i would start sniffing in the air you know, and, and everyone would laugh, right? Now here I am on center stage, right? Getting all the attention. See, the thing of it was is though I would do that until I hyperventilated and fell on the floor, you know? Probably another sign things weren't going to go real well for me. And, and uh, in fact, that proved to be the case. Um, and so my pops came to pick me up and going to take me on a trip. And uh, he brought his friend, Jim Trout. Uh, I always thought there was something a little fishy about that guy, but I'm not sure. At, at any rate, uh, the, we're driving along and I'm being a normal little pain in the ass, right? I'm like, aren't we there yet? How long is this going to take, right? And But this, then all of a sudden, they lit up a lift, left-handed cigarette in the front seat. And I, I, all you could see from me is my nose and my eyes, my two little hands hanging onto the front of, the, or the back of the front seat. And I'm sitting there sniffing in the air. And this time my pops handed it to me. And uh, I'm not sure really what I got out of that. It made me talk a lot. It made me thirsty. And so the only thing they had to drink in that vehicle was some wine. And, you know, not not real wine, but it had alcohol and it. it was sweet. And my pops liked Wild Irish Rose, uh, Boone's Farm, Mad Dog, you know, anything that was cheap and sweet. And uh, so they gave me enough of that and something amazing happened. You see, all my life. I lived really a lot in my head. I was constantly daydreaming, so uh, thinking uh, about resentments, about what other people were thinking. Uh, you know, me standing up to the bully that uh, got over on me and I knuckled under, right? I, I, uh, I didn't stand up to him the way I did in my daydream. Uh, I was constantly thinking in my head about everything. Uh, so many thoughts that I would just get lost. Uh, and really, uh, because of some of the things that I went through uh, as a kid, you know, I learned that I could live in a fantasy world, you know, where uh, I was the star, I had my own theme music, and I didn't have to, uh, I was the guy that had this, the good comeback, right? The one that, you know, I got the better side of the conversation when someone said something sharp to me. And uh those things didn't actually happen, I've got to tell you. 
None of that happened. It just all happened up here. And uh, because of that, I was, you know, people would talk to me. Uh, they would have to repeat themselves over and over because I, I was so self-centered and selfish that I was too busy listening to what was the thoughts in my head to actually listen to other people. I never felt, I always felt lonely. I was really lonely, no matter how many people were in the room. So they, they gave me enough of that wine that it made me feel like I was one of the guys. I was no longer a pain in the ass kid in the back seat. And for the first time, I could connect with another human being. Really nice. It was something I had wanted my whole life. And it just uh, hadn't been able to happen. And alcohol gave me that. And I wanted to go back to that first one over and over. And I would keep trying and keep trying. And later on, I uh, ended up like having a few good times around junior high school and high school when I was probably between uh, 11 and 16. I had some good times. Um, but that was about it. You know, uh, it talks about in A Vision for You, it says that uh, and on page 151, it talks about uh, for most normal folks. Now, I got to tell you, I'm not normal. Uh, drink means... Uh, conviviality and cover colorful companionship it means release from care boredom and worry it means joyous intimacy with friends and a feeling that life is good but not so for us in those last days of drinking those old joys were gone right and it goes on, you know, I mean, that, that really talks about the effect produced by alcohol. Um, and the sensation is so elusive, right, in the doctor's opinion. But the, the, the reason, you know, it really gets into the nitty gritty about the last days. And it talks about the four horsemen, the hideous four horsemen, terror, Intense fear, bewilderment, confusion, frustration, ineffectiveness is one of the definitions of frustration. So I can, I'm no longer effective. And that really makes me angry. And uh, despair, hopelessness, right? Things are hopeless. Um, and really, that's kind of the area that I was living in for a long time. And I'm an alcohol and guy. I'm an alcohol and anything that can increase that pleasure. For me, that's the kind of, that's the experimentation that I kept trying to find a different combination. Um, and more about alcoholism, it gives a, a big list of stuff. And it says we can increase the list ad infinitum, right? So to, basically to infinity, uh, because there are a bunch of combinations that I kept trying uh, to make things uh, feel okay for me. But it didn't work. Uh, so I'll give you an idea of the way I drank. Uh, eventually, I ended up with a gal who drank like me. She got pregnant, had another one on the way. We went to the bar with her girlfriend. It was her birthday, and her boyfriend had a brand-new car. And 
they uh, took, we get to the bar and I'm drinking like I drink. So I'm having Budweiser, seven sevens, and shots of tequila, and a shot of tequila. One drink. <laughs> I don't know anywhere else that you can count three as one, but I always did. And uh, I'm the kind of guy I'm trying to put as much in me as quick as I can to get to the place where I feel okay. And I, I, I can't wait for the wait staff. I'm not waiting for them to get there. Uh, they take far too long. So I go up to the bar and every time I go to the bar to get around, right? I, I, I'm like, I'll go, I'll get it, right? Because I need it. I get to take a shot, right? I need a shot for the walk. <laughs> Send me, please. And that, you know what I mean? That just kind of sums up my drinking. That's the way it was. And uh, the, me and this fella talked and, you know, his brand new car here was February. And uh, so, you know, there was snow, you know, on the sides of the roads, but the roads were clear that day. And as, you know, we're leaving, we our talk and it just kind of started just, you know, flurries a little bit. Uh, and uh, we're like, man, he says, man, well, we can go take a ride for this in this car and just do some crazy stuff. And I'm like, let's get the girls home and then, then we'll go do that. Right. And uh, we took the girls home and, and, Got them there safe, and uh, we left them to the guise of cigarettes, right? And needed cigarettes. And uh, we jumped in the car, and he had a habit of going real fast. And I had a habit of sitting in the passenger seat going, woohoo. I didn't like driving crazy after I've been drinking. Uh, I've been to jail too many times, right? And uh, so we were driving crap, driving crazy, going all over the roads. And uh, we w went over some railroad tracks that were famous uh, in our area that you could get all four wheels in the air if you were going fast enough. And uh, we hit those railroad tracks at about 100 miles an hour and the car flipped on its side and uh, smashed against a tree and I never walked again. I really never walked again. And uh, that that's kind of a picture of the decisions that I make when I'm drinking. And uh, it's funny that in the foreword of the 12 and 12, it says that the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, when practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and allow the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. And uh, that, that really means a lot to me today. And, and I'll tell you some reasons why, you know, when we get a little further. Um, I ended up at the, after that, accident you know um me losing my ability to walk my ability to work my ability to do a lot of things because i always worked with my hands and my back i never really succeeded at life i never had the thing you call a career i uh i'm the kind of guy like when i go to work uh I think that I work so hard that on time every day is a suggestion. <laughs> it's a suggestion for those of you that just don't work as hard as I do. But when I'm there, I work so hard that me being there on time or five days a week or more, you know, that's kind of a suggestion. And, uh, 
I have a habit of that. So, you know, it didn't, you know, that's the way my life had gone up to that point. And so I, I never really paid into to Social Security so I wouldn't get much out. So I decided to, to subsidize my income. Uh, and so I'm the kind of guy that likes to procure items for other people. And uh, I, I like being the one guy that knows where I can get everything that goes with alcohol, right? And uh, I do it for like three reasons. One, I know I'm going to get some of whatever I pick up. Two, I think it'll make you like me. And three, it made me feel important. And man, did I need to feel important. And uh, so I decided I'm going to do that on a grander scale, right, to support my family. And uh, But I, I'm really not good at this, right, because I don't understand about not using so much of it, you know, that you can't make money. I don't understand about not sharing with people because I think it'll make them like me and it'll make me feel important. Um, that kind of stuff. And my house just looked like a parking lot or a gas station, right? People pulling in, pulling out, pulling in, pulling out. It just looked bad. Um, I had really loud stereo and I was always drunk and, and you know, I, I used to play this song by Ugly Kid Joe that said, won't you be my effing neighbor, right? <laughs> Nobody wanted to be my neighbor, I got to tell you. No one did. But uh, that's the kind of guy I was, and it didn't take very long, and I was in jail. And uh, between that and, and my terrible, terrible past, you know, I went to jail for really dumb things in the past, like I didn't pay my tickets and stuff. And I got pulled over one time by a cop that was the first one that put me in the youth home, right? When I was like 12 for stealing out of cars when I was drunk. And uh, he pulled me over. He, he didn't give me a drunk driving because I already had seven warrants for my arrest for stuff like unpaid tickets and, you know, driving the wrong way on a one way when I'm shit faced, you know, stuff like that. And uh, so this time I go to jail, I got this passed and, and all this other stuff. And the judge is just about tired of me. And I got six years uh, in between state and federal prison. And uh, I got to, I forgot to mention that, you know, when I was in that hospital, man, I, it took me like, as soon as they would let me sit up in a cardiac chair, which is like a stretcher with wheelchair wheels in the middle, and it kind of sits up. And I was sit, I was outside smoking left-handed cigarettes and drinking. And so, like, the, the big book talks about on page 24, uh, for reasons yet obscure, we have lost the power of choice in drink. We are unable to pull into our consciousness with sufficient force, like sufficient force not to drink. The suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago, we are without defense, gets the first drink. That's me. I'm a real alcoholic, and that's what I do. Without help, it is too much for me. And uh, so th I, that's the kind of stuff that I do. It's just automatic, and I don't have a choice. It's going to happen to me. And so when I went to prison, there was a, a program in there that, you know, if, if you uh, – 
had a problem with drugs or alcohol, you would qualify for this program. Uh, it's like a nine month in a separate unit uh, and you get time off your sentence. And I said, time off my sentence. I have a problem. I have a real problem. Now, I got to tell you, it wasn't because I wanted to get sober or clean or any of that stuff. It was because I had time off my sentence and I knew that would get me back to a drink. Now, there was drinking while I was in prison. You know, we had spud juice and stuff that we made, but. You know, it wasn't like drinking out in the world. And uh, so I went through this treatment thing and, you know, there are people in there uh, running it. And we had three AA meetings, one every three months. Now, they didn't give me a big book. It was run by psychologists and counselors that talked a lot about me, to me about the things that happened in my childhood. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, they're trying to help. It's a wonderful program. Uh, but really, uh, they, they kind of gave me a lot of knowledge. They told me about those things in my past that set up some of the choices that I made in the future. And all that is true. All that's true, but it got nothing to do with me being an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because I have an allergy and obsession. The obsession is the stuff that, you know, like when I'm not drinking, I'm planning what I'm going to drink or use uh, the whole time. And sometimes I'm even planning it while I'm doing it, you know. It's, it's all I think about, and it guarantees me that even if I'm sober for a while, I'm going to go back to that because it's what I think about all the time. And then I have the allergy that uh, if I put one in, that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put more in, and I tell myself I'm changing my mind. I tell, you know, like, uh, well, I'm going to stop by and have one, right? I never stopped and had one, <laughs> never. And, 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 you know, I'll tell them, oh, well, well, here's Charlie. I guess, I guess maybe I'll have two more. And, uh, well, you know, what that all of a sudden I'm bargaining. And I'm, I mean, this is all going on in my head. This is what goes on. My head just is going crazy. And uh, when I'm not thinking about drinking, I'm thinking about, uh, all the stuff, all the other stuff, the negative self-talk, and you're a piece of shit, and you ought to just kill yourself, that kind of stuff, you know, I mean, that's, the, that's like at the extreme, but like the other little stuff, like, you're so stupid, you know, I make decisions, it's so funny that there's this, this committee going on in my head, right, I make decisions, and then the committee tells me, how stupid I was for doing that. I'm like, where were you guys when I was before I did this? <laughs> and anyway, so I give you, I go through this program and I get out of there. I got five years supervised release. Uh, and, you know, from federal prison, it's not like parole that you have from state prison. And that, uh, Parole, it, 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 this supervised release is, is just like parole. And, and you know, I got to drop. I got to go to meetings. I got to do all this stuff. But I'm not really paying attention to what they're saying in meetings. I'm not paying attention to the fact that I need God in my life. I just think, if you know, everything will be okay if I manage well, right? And, and because, you know, don't you know? Willpower didn't work when I was in the hospital, and the self knowledge that they gave me in there lasted seven months. With all that hanging over my head, right? I'm going to go back to prison and serve out that time I got off. I'm going to, you know, come out, start that five years over. 
I get a job when I get out because one thing I did is I, I took an office occupations class so I could learn how to work in a wheelchair while I was in there. And uh, I met a really great gal at the job that, that I got out of there. And uh, she's really wonderful. But she's also cute and smoked left-handed cigarettes and drank. <laughs> So I made it about seven months. And then one Christmas Eve, I decided I'm going to impress her. So I go out and get some really good left-handed cigarettes. And I like that garbage she was smoking. Told myself all this in my head, right? But uh, then we're sitting there after, you know, Christmas Eve, her, her then husband, was out of town and a cute girl with a husband out of town signed me up. And uh, that's the kind of decisions I make. And so I, I was slippery and managed to stay out of jail for a while. And uh, she and I just did a lot of damage. And, uh, you know, eventually, that damage uh, got us both in trouble. And 2009, I come to Alcoholics Anonymous to your custody. And uh, I worked really, really hard. I got a sponsor. I did like eight and a half steps. <laughs> I know there are 12 of them, but I figured they were probably suggestions for people that were real sick like y'all, but I didn't probably need, I'd work really hard at these ones and hey, you get it. Uh, so I uh, started making coffee and opening meetings and doing some of those things, that busy stuff. And, and pretty soon in my head started getting so big, I couldn't fit a hat on it. And I'm going around and I'm telling everyone, Hey, look at me. I, I'm opening this meeting and I'm making coffee over here. And I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I'm I, me, me, me. I, I, yeah. So I went out and drank. And then uh, now I got uh, another seven years before I make it back to you folks. And in 2016, I had three strokes because all that living fast, uh, living hip slick and cool and thinking I got all the answers and that stuff just didn't work. And uh, me continuing to find, try to find a combination that'll work to make this thing happened for me and uh i can never seem to get back to that time in the back of that car with my pops and jim i can never seem to get back to that and a lot of it's because i was so selfish and self-centered i never had a real relationship with anyone i never asked them about who they were and and about their family and please tell me about your dog and whatever else I didn't I didn't care it was all about me and uh in this in this on page uh you know I, I still let me let me say this my wife has been sober since 2009 she said I wasn't so bad or I wouldn't, she would, she would have left me, but I'm not sure, you know, I wasn't a real great guy. That's for sure. And uh, when uh, all this happened, she said to me, she said, you know, we could call Monica. Monica is a friend of ours in Alcoholics Anonymous who also was a therapist because I was going out of my mind. When I first got in that wheelchair, 
everything was taken away from me, all that stuff. And I started going crazy. But this stroke did the same thing to me because I had learned how to live in that wheelchair. I was able to drive a car, uh, you know, work. I was able to keep house, wash dishes, cook food, all these things. And all of a sudden that stuff's all ripped away from me. And uh, I need help to get dressed. I need help to do almost everything. I can't get out of that bed on my own. I need a lot of help. I'm very fortunate, you know, my 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 wife, uh, my angel, you know, the angel that's in my life, you know, she gets me uh, ready and helps me help other people that I'm able to sponsor people. And even over this platform, I've learned so much and I've been able to sponsor people in other countries and uh, do a lot of things like that. But let me put myself where I was at. This therapist come to our house once a week for probably two months. Help me work through some of the, you know, me and my craziness. And then eventually she said one of the most spiritual things I've ever heard. Don't you think it's time you should call your sponsor? So I did, and he did what you all do. He, with love, said to me, absolutely. He was responsible when the hand of AA was, was when I needed it, you know. And... Uh, so we went through and covered some of the stuff in the book. And when we we went to page 60, all of a sudden the book started coming alive to me. I started remembering it like never before because I think it was because I was finally willing to go to any length. I was willing to do some things. I was uh, willing to to go at this like the drowning. And uh, I look at these pages and they just start popping into my memory now, you know, and, and page 16, I'm, and I'm convinced of those first, th first three ABC that I, I was an alcoholic and I couldn't manage my own life and that probably no human power could and that God could and would if he were sought that uh, finally on page 62, it says, so our troubles we think are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves and the alcoholic is me. I'm an extreme example of self will run riot, but I usually don't think so. And then it says this, two words, above everything. What? The most important thing, we must be rid of this selfishness. I got to get rid of this selfishness or to kill me. God makes that possible. And there seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. I had moral and philosophical convictions galore, right? I always held everyone around me to the standard that I couldn't reach, right? I would say, you need to be honest. You need to be this. You need to be forthright. I couldn't be any of them. I was the least authentic person you would meet. But for me, um, I have to get past that. People allow me to make mistakes and other people, I got to allow them to make mistakes. Matter of fact, 
I'm in the world to make mistakes. It's my job. You know, God looking at me like, uh, what is this guy up to, right? Well, he's being human. That's what we do. And that's what, you know, why, do, why wouldn't I look at other people the same way God looks at me? Allow them to be human. And I clear away some of the wreckage of my past. I get to look at some of the things that are blocking me from God. And my sponsor uh, helps me to see a few more. And, and he looks at me and he said to me, you know, I remember I said I was real sensitive, right? So I thought maybe he was being mean, but really he wouldn't mind hurting my feelings if it would save my life. And he said, Glenn, you got to stop pretending. You got to stop pretending. You see, more than most, the alcoholic leads double life. To his fellows, he presents the stage character he thinks they want to see. And that's what I was doing. I was running around pretending to be this guy because I thought that all these guys watching sports, you know, and I would watch Sports Center, pretend like I knew what was going on, right? I was spending out. They they actually watch the game, right? I'm watching highlights and pretending like I know what's going on because I think that's what they want to see. And that's just one instance. I could give you a bunch of them, but that's just one instance. And uh, I get to have a program that teaches me about this selfishness. And I get to be in step 10. After I get myself clean, I get to stay clean. Alexa, stop. And anyway, I get to, you know, put myself uh, to, to be authentic and start to keep all of that stuff that was blocking me so I don't build up another one. And it says to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And selfishness is me just trying to get my way. And dishonesty is me lying, trying to get my way. Resentment, I'm angry because I didn't get my way. And uh, fear is me, I'm afraid I'm not going to get my way or going to lose something I have or whatever I want. All that stuff is about me and my way. And I need things that simple. You know, it says rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. What path? The 12 steps. Usually men and women who are constitutionally enabled to be honest with themselves. You know, that's me. I couldn't see me until I could see me, and I couldn't hear until I could hear. So I hope that you guys can hear something. I always like to share something, a like reading or something. I don't have time for some of the other ones, but here is this one. I'm a real fan of Emmett Fox. I might give you an idea of where my higher power is, but, uh, and uh, so uh, Emmett Fox around the year is great. It lets me see a little piece of Emmett Fox every day. It's a small reading book and it talks about uh, the poor in spirit, he, it's a really long thing in, in uh, the book, but this is a small reading. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit does not mean in the least what we call poor spirited. To be poor in spirit means to be, have emptied yourself of all desire to exercise self-will and what is just as important to have renounced all preconceived opinions in the wholehearted search for God. It means to be willing to set aside your present habits of thought, your present views and prejudices, your present way of life, if necessary, to jettison, in fact, anything and everything that can stand in the way 
of your finding God. So in this program, it talks about uh, God being the one thing that can get between me and a drink when no one else is around. So I quit having higher people and I start having a higher power. I'm really grateful I got to come here and hang out with you guys. I'm sorry if I talked too long or kept you busy too long. I'm really grateful. Uh, may God bless you all. I do love you. I'm Glenn. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.